Um, yeah, as I said, welcome to panel two uh, of this uh, afternoon's uh, program. Today, uh, we are going to hear some scholarship presentations. And we are really, really proud and really excited uh, about uh, this program. So this is the program where we, uh, as a cooperative, try to support uh, especially early career researchers and teachers um, to everybody who helps uh, people to learn about handwritten text recognition technology and uh, transcribers in particular. And yeah, let's see what uh, some of those uh, wonderful people around the world have been up to. Uh, the title of this session is From Non-Latin Character to Layout Analysis to Research Data's Impact, Learning by Experience, uh, experience and Sharing Solutions. And as you know, the co-op is all about sharing. And let's see what uh, the speakers of this session uh, have to share. Uh, first up is Constanta Borlaco uh, from the University of Oxford with her talk about Old Romanian, transcription, translation, or interpretation. Yeah, I'm not sure how much of a solution I'll offer, but I definitely uh, would like to offer some questions. Let me just get going with this so that everything is on um, up and going. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, okay, wonderful. So I uh, shall start by saying that um, Old Romanian, which is dated between the very beginning of the 16th century, that's when we have our first text, um, and the kind of end of the 18th century, the 19th century, uh, scholars have been experienced uh, kind of How is it possible? Sweden was a sparsely populated area. There were very really significant resources. So the answer lies in the state building process. Traditionally, it has been seen that the constant war made Sweden strong. Like the sociologist Charles Bill has said, war made the state and state made war. Usually, the state building is approached from the macro level by studying teams and how. Wonderful. <laughs> no worries. Um, could you use the yeah. interview mic? The disadvantage of being a tall person. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, such as the T that with the comment that you can see in my name, which is uh, stands for T. Um, that's, for example, present in the Cyrillic uh, alphabet, and for the Latin, it needed to be adapted, of course, to the lingu linguistic needs of Romanian. Now, another introductory um, kind of word, uh, transcription, transliteration, and interpretative phonetic uh, transcription. Transcription, we all know, that's what we do with uh, transcribers. Uh, transliteration is instead the action of kind of um, changing from one script to another, the same content of, of a text. And in my case, it would be um, taking the original Cyrillic script and adapting it to the Latin one. And interpretive phonetic transcription is something that's present, that we find indeed in Romanian scholarship. And I kind of quote, I kind of don't quote, um, I translated it myself and interpreted it. Uh, it's the practice of transliterating a piece of text written with Cyrillic letters into Latin letters by applying orthographic rules derived from Romanian history of phonology and or current spelling rules. And this is a little bit problematic. I will tell you more in detail why. And so I wonder whether interpretative phonetic transcription is even an adequate um, um, kind of label to put down to it. Um, Again, my personal needs were um, philological, 
I wanted to understand to work on two uh, early, biblic uh, early uh, translated bo biblical books. Uh, so I worked on the soldier and the apostolos, so the Acts of the Apostles and the Epistles. And at the very beginning, I tried to understand what was the original source, and I realized that it was a uh, church Slavonic source. And then I tried to draw the stemma codicum, so to understand how the um, witnesses, the textual witnesses that we've inherited, um, are linked, if at all, to one another. Um, because the work was mainly lexical, I decided not to transliterate the sources, and so kind of put myself aside from Romanian scholarship, let's say, and um, keep the original Cyrillic script. Um, just a couple of names, because they will come up in the models that then have been devised. Um, important point, my sources uh, were manuscripts and printed books. Everything happens in the 16th century. Um, they were monolingual and bilingual, so Romanian with Cyrillic script, but also Church Slavonic interlinear with Romanian. So not a column and a column, but literally a piece of text followed by the Romanian translation. Again, some names so that you kind of get your ear um, used to it. Hurzumaki's Psalter is the most important one that uh, will be also my case study. Um, there is the Voronets Codex, the Skea Psalter, Brato Codex is a bilingual one, and uh, Koresi is the big name for typography in Romanian um, history of, of, uh, of the book. Um, okay, let's get started with the models. How I got into all of this. Um, first of all, I've been quite lucky because for Church Slavonic, there are um, some uh, publicly available models that are um, very good and they are provided by Ahim Rabus from the uh, Freiburg University who will be speaking tomorrow actually. Now, good starting point, at least not completely scared. Um, but because uh, Transcribus learns also linguistic features, it would work only on half of my, well, half of a half of a half of my um, uh, data. So the Cyrillic part in the bilingual manuscript. And so although the characters would be similar, the script is similar, the linguistic data per se is different because we are dealing with another language. So I needed to train my own models. Um, this is kind of schematically what I've been up to. Um, we already know this, it's a process of recycling. You start transcribing, you put, you create a little model and then you keep on transcribing and then another little model and so on. So for me, it has been like an accordion. You would have a small um, source base um, model and then I would put together other models, uh, like combine them and so on and so forth. And again, because some, some sources are monolingual and some others are bilingual, some printed and some other are handwritten, uh, the outcome has been uh, varying. The best one is the first one, which is based on printed sources. And I must admit that I didn't even need that many uh, word tokens for that. Um, it's, yeah, it's even less than 4,000 and it's already below a 5% um, error rate. So that was good. Um, second half of the presentation. Oh no, sorry. That was not supposed to. I thought I, I sorry, that was not supposed to be there. Uh, second half, the presentation, so case study. I then wanted to address this transcribing, transliterating, interpreting, what do we do? How can I use transcribers for this? So my case study has been the Hurmuzaki soldier. It's the earliest source ever. Linguistically, a chaos, very interesting. Um, so the first attempt has been to um, get as much of a good model as possible for the um, recognition of the Cyrillic characters. Now, I basically uh, transcribed all the, all the um, uh, manuscript, so like 200 and something pages, uh, checked it all, and then created a model, and that model goes to 5.5% error rate. So basically that's as good as it gets. I don't have many more folia for this manuscript, so that's it. Um, I then thought of a, I must say, I must say not perfect 
um, table of correspondence between the Cyrillic and the Latin um, uh, characters, which you see here. And then kind of in an automatic manner, I um, feed into, fed into the um, transcribers, the transliterated data, and then created another model. This model has an error rate of 7.3%, so not great, but a good starting point. And I've done this automatically. So there is something called Protea, not, I mean, um, it's, it's basically, you can put in this chart that you see to the left uh, with the correspondence, and then it automatically, you, you bring in your file or text, and then it automatically basically transliterates. If you are into programming, you can, you can do that as well. Not programming, so I've decided to do it this way. Um, now, the problem is that there are some problematic letters for, hmm, for uh, uh, Church Slavonic, so the way they are interpreted phonetically in Romanian. For example, the first one, K, is usually transliterated as C, and it has this phonetically is K. Now, if K is followed by the uh, front of vowels E or um, I or E, that's kind of difficulty with English, um, in modern Romanian, you write it with, follow, the C is followed by an H, so to have the same sound of ki, K, because if you write C and then I or C and E, um, it's like in modern uh, Italian, it's che, chi, right? So it's a completely different, um, phonetically, it's a completely different um, phenomenon, which needs interpreting, say. When it goes down to the vowels, it's even more difficult. Um, so for example, uh, you can see the, these ones uh, in Slavonic studies, they are called Yeru. They even have three different um, interpretations, possible interpretations. Uh, so that's what we have the schwa in, in English, bottle, right? Uh, uh, or no phonetic value at all. So what do we do with that? In my previous here chart, I just kind of gave them a random, well, a random symbol coming from Slavonic studies so that I have a one-to-one -one correspondence. But those phenomena need interpreting. Um, so, yes, two minutes. Uh, that's the outcome here to the right of just kind of doing diplomatic transliteration. And this instead is um, my picture, diplomatic transliteration. Uh, I must confess that to a modern Romanian, this would sound a little bit incomprehensible. And then that's the interpreted uh, transliteration or what Romanians would call interpretive phonetic uh, transcription. Now, I have not yet found a solution for how to make transcribers uh, become that into that. Um, and I wonder if that's possible at all. Um, open floor for discussion. Um, I will skip this. And then, yeah, to go down to my conclusions, basically for based on my PhD experience, I think that the um, current state of affairs when it comes to textual editions of old Romanian is very chaotic. <laughs> uh, do the, do, do the many uh, approaches apply to, um, to making critical editions? and especially this phenomenon of interpreting certain letters. I don't think that we should uh, disregard completely what has been done so far. It is important for us to interpret certain linguistic phenomena, but I do think that before getting to that step, step we need the raw data. We need to make um, uh, scholars kind of access that data. And that's what I would like to do probably in the future. So make digital editions if possible. Um, Here's a little bit of a bibliography with an exclamation mark, which was not supposed to be there, but it's just to kind of show my enthusiasm for you listening to me. And I'm open to whatever questions you have. <laughs>